Sophie Pound, welcome to Australian Musician. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I couldn't go too far without talking about the weekend that you've just had. Um, yeah. <laughs> on Saturday, you played in front of 100,000 people at the MCG at the grand final. Um, how was that? Uh, it was pretty fun. Um, yeah, I thought Robbie was awesome and it was just really awesome to be, it was so great to be a part of it, but also with so many of my friends, you know, there was quite a lot of horn players and um, some of the guys in the band are guys I know pretty well. So it was exciting for us to be a part of that. It was really special. Yeah. yeah. Are you a footy fan in general? I yeah. am, but a D supporter. So oh, okay. I wish it was last year. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been even better, but uh, you know, it's still pretty good. And Victorian team still won, so that's, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, and then from there, you went to the Jazz Lab, where you uh, performed uh, a global live stream for the OJAZ platform. Uh, a, a very busy day. Yeah, it was a it was a long day. <laughs> yeah. I was very tired afterwards. Yeah. So how did that performance go? The the live stream. How did that go? Oh yeah, it was really good. It was it was great. It's great. I play at Jazz Lab regularly, and I love playing there. So yeah. Stars, so great that uh, that performance is actually available. Uh, is it now or in a couple of days? People can view that. So I think from tomorrow it'll be available on O Jazz TV. Um, I think it's from tomorrow. Yeah. So it'll be available. Uh, yeah, from tomorrow on O Jazz TV. How important do you think programs like OJAZ are to the growth of jazz worldwide? Because it's still uh, an underexposed genre, really, isn't it? Yeah, I, and I think it's a genre that maybe um, it's underexposed, but the people that like it are very dedicated. I think um, jazz fans are, you know, they're, uh, they're, it takes a certain level of, you have to really love the music, you know, it takes a certain level of commitment to be a jazz fan. And then, um, so I think there's a lot of really small, dedicated communities all around the world. And I think there is a growing global community since the internet, you know. It used to be so centred around New York and it felt like you had to go there if you wanted to have a jazz, you know, the whole jazz scene sort of gravitated there and people would leave where they were from to go to New York. But that doesn't feel the same anymore. I mean, New York is still a hub but there's all these smaller scenes, Melbourne being one, with this sort of unusual take on jazz. So I think from my perspective as a Melbourne jazz musician, it's anything that helps you to connect with the global jazz community is really great because I think the music that we have here, not just in Melbourne, in Sydney as well and all around Australia, is quite unique and special. So being able to tap into any larger audience is really fantastic for us. Yeah. So growing up, what were you listening to? Who, who were the uh, the trumpet and vocal uh, influences? Um, well, there's quite a lot of people. Um, I My mum really liked George Benson, and I listened to a lot of that when I was younger, and I still, I love, I love him. Um, and then I sort of went through a lot of phases, but the first, tr the trumpet player that was really, spoke to me and sort of, made took me to where I am today was definitely Roy Hargrove I bought a CD of his from Borders you know it Borders that so you could like scan the barcode and just listen to samples I sort of just scanned the barcode of all the trumpet players that I could find in the jazz section and I heard a little 30 second snippet of this album uh called um Hard Groove by the RH Factor which was Roy Hargrove's band and um I just like absolutely loved it and it also had on it the people that have become my favorite singers um Erica Badu and D'Angelo and those guys but probably earlier than that if I'm really honest <laughs> I really loved Harry Connick Jr um and that's sort of what took me to it in the first place I used to watch Parkinson on Sunday nights and Harry Connick Jr was a guest once and I have this really clear memory of being like that's the coolest guy I've ever seen and I want to do that and just thinking it was so great and then my parents bought me his one of his albums and that was sort of the very first 
jazz that I really, really got into. And I, I was a real fangirl for Harry Connick Jr. <laughs> yeah. Um, apart from your own music, uh, you've played with many different projects, uh, such as uh, Leisure Centre, the, the soul band, and uh, yeah. uh, Audre, the uh, electro funk thing. Are, are they projects that uh, are still active for you? Uh, neither of them are active anymore, sadly, but I still play with uh, like James Bowers, who I played with on Saturday night, he was in both of those bands, the keyboard player. He's a great keyboardist. And Audrey was a duo project between the two of us. So we sort of like, you know, Audrey was really fun, but maybe we grew out of it <laughs> a little bit. It was sort of like uh, we we were both studying jazz and taking it very seriously, you know, our careers as a instrumentalist. And then um, Audrey was sort of a... a fun project that we sort of I mean we called one of our records more is more because we just did whatever we wanted to do and which ended up just so many ideas but it was a real sort of relief from the seriousness um of our instrumental careers as an instrumentalist to just make this sort of outrageous pop music and Leisure Centre you know um it was called the Do Your Things before we changed our name and we were around for a really long time and uh, we put out an album on Hope Street Records, which I still think is really, really great. So, yeah, I, I, I loved being a part of that band. And I didn't play trumpet in that band at all, so it was really a, a great thing for me personally. Yeah, and you're a fabulous trumpet player and, and singer as well, which is quite unique. Uh, when did you first realise that you could combine both in performance? saw Louis Armstrong when I was pretty young I really loved that movie High Society and Louis was in that singing and playing and I think a lot of trumpet players end up singing because I think there's a really strong connection to play the trumpet you have to really be able to hear the notes in your head to because pitching the notes on the trumpet is quite difficult as well so it's sort of while as you develop trumpet playing you're probably developing your um, singing as well um, but I started I had a band with a friend of mine who's now also, he's very successful, uh, Alejandro Abapo, whose like music pseudonym, I guess, is uh, Silent J, and he's doing really well. He actually does backing vocals in Hiatus Cody now. But he, um, he and I had a band, like a funk band, that started off instrumental, and we were playing like, you know, some old boogaloo instrumental stuff. And then the band was sort of doing quite well and there was this talk about getting a singer and JJ and I were both like, we'll sing, we'll sing. We didn't want to get a singer. So we sort of both put our hand up and then, yeah, and, and started doing it. And um, I think I was really lucky. I was at the VCA at the time and I just had some great singers around me that gave me lots of advice. And I started getting really into jazz singers like Betty Carter, who's my personal favourite vocalist of all time. Betty Carter and um, yeah, I really got into uh, Billie Holiday as well. Yeah. Do you think trumpet will always be part of your performance? Yeah, definitely. I still feel a lot more confident and competent as a trumpet player than I do as a singer. Yeah. Um, tell me about your main trumpet. Uh, what is it? And how did you acquire it? Oh, the instrument? Yeah. Um, well, it's actually very special and it was a uh, lockdown purchase. <laughs> um, it's a Monet, which is a very fancy, it's sort of like the Rolls Royce trumpet brand. Um, and I probably have the lowest level of that. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's a Monet XLT. And it's actually kind of a mm. special because another two trumpet players that I love in Melbourne have played it before me. So one of my teachers, Paul Williamson, trumpet player, who's amazing, incredible Australian trumpet player, and a huge influence on me and every Australian trumpet player. He had it first. Um, I'm not quite sure how he got his hands on it, but he had it. And um, they're quite rare. Monet, they're handmade by David Monet, so there's not that many of them. But then he sold it to Ruben Lewis, who is another fantastic local trumpet player who's in the Australian Art Orchestra and has a band called I Hold the Lions Poor. He's fantastic. And then he bought a new trumpet and he sort of messaged me and was like, hey, I think you'd really like this trumpet. You should try it out. And I was like, I do not want to spend that money right now and buy a new trumpet. And I started playing it and I just loved it so much. And 
Yeah, but I, I like that I know the other two trumpet players that have played it, and they're both really great, so that's nice for me. <laughs> Legacy. Yeah. Um, you've played such a wide variety and, and some amazing gigs, really. Do, do you have amazing, uh, amazing management skills yourself, or is there someone else behind <laughs> the bookings? No, I have no management or anything like that. It just sort of happens. I don't know. I've been really, really lucky this year. Um, I just sort of had a couple of gigs and then got got more and sort of, yeah. I mean, I always try and make a real effort to be, like to make sure I do a really good job when I get a gig. So I guess that's the closest thing to management skills. But I, yeah, I think I've been really, really lucky, especially the last couple of years. It just seems to have all um, been a nice domino thing where I get one gig that leads to another. And yeah. I've, well, I've well, played with some amazing people. It's been yeah, great. let's let's talk about a few of them. The, the Teskey Brothers, you toured overseas with them. Uh, what are yeah. your memory, memories of the tour? Uh, it, it was so amazing and one of the like best experiences of my life was going on their a US tour with them. It was actually we were supporting Tash Sultana. So and the that was I think 2019 when they were just starting to break America. So we played on Jimmy Kimmel and did a couple of those sorts of things. But we went through and supporting Tash it was just a like bucket list venue tour of um, the US. We played at the Ryman Theatre in Nashville and, um, you know, the uh, Red Rocks in Colorado, which was incredible. But the best part about it is Josh Teske, I just think, has one of the most beautiful voices I've ever heard. It, every night it was just stunning. I loved the music. Um, and every night I just sort of got to watch because we were the support band. It was mostly Tash Sultana's crowd. And, you know, we'd sort of get out there and the audience would be a bit like, who are these, you know, <laughs> who are these Australian hippies? What is this? And Josh would start singing and the whole crowd, just win the crowd over with his first phrase. Like I remember the song we played first, it was called Man of the Universe. And every night just watching Josh's voice, wow, this new group of Americans was so special. And the, I was really lucky, the trombone player that I played with on that tour, Ernest Stewart, was an incredible musician. He was a American guy. Um, from He's from Philadelphia, but New York based. And I learned a lot from playing with him. It was a really great experience for me. Yeah. Uh, Soul Deep with Jimmy Barnes, a very brassy <laughs> tour. That must have been a lot of fun too. That was, that was amazing. Another highlight of my life. It was really incredible. Jimmy was, yeah, everyone in that band was just so great and so nice and beautiful and yeah Jimmy is is really special and it was so awesome to be a part of that band and a part of that tour um and his daughter who ran the band Mahalia is another really sp special person and um there were three backing vocalists that were just amazing yeah that was a really really great tour and just to experience Jimmy's energy on stage was really really special <laughs> Yeah, um, and a tool that uh, I caught a, a couple of times, Midnight Oil. Uh, that must have been pretty special too. <laughs> that was special. That one was a bit scary, you know. Scary for me, like just, uh, you know, that's iconic music playing, um, you know, Power and the Passion and uh, just with Peter Garrett sort of behind you, giving you, the, I was just like sort of staring in front just like, don't mess it up, don't mess it up. It was very high pressure, but inc incredible band and so amazing. I still can't really believe that I got to do that, but I did. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, you spoke about uh, New York and uh, its importance to jazz music. Uh, you got to perform and record there as well. You played at the famous 55 Bar, which I believe is closed now. Yeah, 55 Bar. Sadly, it's it's gone. Yeah. Who, did you, who did you play with there? Uh, I played with, she was actually my housemate, but an amazing singer, Emily Braden, really beautiful jazz singer. And then I played with my, my own band with some friends in from New York there as well, which was really awesome. Yeah. So let's talk about your own music. What's what's the current single? And uh, are you walking, working towards a new EP or even an album? Well, I've actually got an album that I've sort of just finished that will be coming out 
at some point. But uh, with the band I played with on Saturday, um, I recorded with them, but also with a string quartet. And um, yeah, I've made a new album that's going to be called From the Fire that should be out pretty soon. It's more of a spiritual jazz sort of thing. And it's kind of an extension of a song that I put out a couple of years ago now called Bleeding Hearts, which was on a um, Brownswood, which is a UK jazz label. It was on a compilation that they did called Sunny Side Up of Australian music. And then I sort of had a great experience playing that. They, that was sort of to brief. They wanted spiritual jazz. So um sort of taken that and run with it a little bit um but I also have an EP that came out a couple of years ago that's on on the internet that's that's a, a soul soul jazz sort of sort of thing soul music with trumpet solos I guess is, it, is that bed I made you're talking about yeah bed yeah. I made, yeah yeah so did you learn anything from making that EP that you took into the album so much so so much uh the, my new album i've produced myself and uh, done all the arranging and everything but i did my ep with a great american producer called Tariq khan who works with bilal and you know a bunch of neo soul artists in new york and um i just watched him we did a lot of sessions at his studio in brooklyn um hybrid music his his name and I just sort of watched him mixing and tried to learn he uses a lot of analog equipment and he's really good at creating a sonic um space in his records and I definitely took a lot of that and and I I learned so much from him and also the musicians that I had play on that EP were just so amazing and easy to work with and yeah, I learned a lot from playing with them as well, particularly guitarist Randy Runyon, who was just another person that just brought a real sonic presence to the record. So, yeah, I definitely tried to recreate a little bit of that here as well. So, in general, what's the starting point for an Audrey Pound song? <laughs> um, oh, that's a good question. It's usually like I write everything on keys or piano, it's usually either a groove or um, like probably maybe my best song, Taboo, was, it was like a groove that I sort of had in mind or chord, like a chord that I really like, voicings that I really like. I'll sort of start with that and then follow my ears. Lyrics is probably always the last thing for me, lyrics and melody. I sort of, that's just the way I work. I'm very, I love harmony and I'll sort of, find a harmonic or a groove, a harmonic bass, a chord progression or a groove, and then eventually I'll put the melody on top. But it's almost always chords first for me. Yeah. So what's on for the rest of 2022? Um, I've got a couple of, oh, good question. What is on? I'm doing some stuff with, uh, I've been doing some string arranging for an amazing singer, Tando, who's just... Uh, she's fantastic, local singer. Um, and I've got to fini finish my album. Uh, and I've got a couple of gigs with Rob Burke and Paul Grabowski coming up, which should be pretty cool. But, yeah, it's all starting to wind down a little bit, actually. I've, I, I had such a hectic <laughs> weekend. But I do have another Jazz Lab show in November as well. But that'll be with a different a different band, so more of a j like straight ahead jazz quartet as well. Yeah. So what's the grand plan for Audrey Pound? <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> Play in more jazz festivals is kind of what I'd really like to do. Um, but I've actually had an amazing year playing with other people and doing a bit more session work. So I'd love to. I mean. I don't know if it will happen, but if I had, if everything goes my way, I would love to put my record out and and spend some, go back to New York next year for sure. I'm definitely going to go back and play with my friends there again and hopefully be able to uh, use the record I'm putting out to get some jazz festival gigs overseas and and play play with my friends again over there. It would be amazing. Yeah. Well, it's been a uh, great catch up. Uh, people can... Uh watch your performance from last Saturday at the Jazz Lab on the OJAZ platform. And uh, thanks for chatting with us.
Thanks so much, Greg. Nice to meet you.